Yes, 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 people, you are listening to Chat and Breeze. Welcome back to episode two. Today I am joined with my good friend and collaborator on the Heart Machine album, The Orbinator, AKA Travis Orbin. That's right, people. He goes by The Orbinator first and his real name second. <laughs> How are you, bro? Greetings and salutations. I'm well. How are you? Yeah, bro. I've just come back from a long day of work and just drank my protein coffee, ready to get in some breeze, some deep breeze. Of the okay, so variety. Before I hand it over to you, bro, I'm going to give you a little intro. If you didn't know, Travis Orbin is the current drummer for Metalcore Pioneers uh, Darkest Hour. He is a founding member of Periphery and is a prolific session drummer. Uh, has been and has worked with artists such as Intervals, Nick Johnston, and of course the Heart Machine. Um, he's a busy guy, and he's a sick guy. And uh, but before we get into that, I want to ask you, bro. Tell us about, t- tell us all the way back to the beginning. How you got into drums? How you got into music? Well, it all began way back in 1995. Let us take a trip down memory lane. Uh, yeah, nine, well, I guess. How old were you? I could I could go back a bit further than that. Um, Bruv, well, ninety five. You know there was something. Sorry to interrupt. There was something on your bio. I think you should take it all the way back there. Okay. Well, I don't really have any sort of explanation for it, other than even back in the earliest grade school days, like first, second, maybe third grade, I was just kind of aimlessly beating on desks i would get in trouble for it and then uh around that time i got into metallica uh specifically the record injustice for all that's what uh well i got into metallica initially when the black album came out so that was 91 which would have made me eight and uh so i went yeah i went back and uh discovered Injustice for All for myself. Um, I don't know, probably like nine, 10, maybe 11 at most. And uh, yeah, that's what, uh, that's what really got me interested in drums. Before that, it was just the music that kind of enamored me, but then it became the drums. <clears throat> and then my parents uh, kind of eased me into it. They gave me first a practice pad with some sticks and then a really cheap synthesizer kit, which I played endlessly. And then 95, the tail end of 95, my, my birthday is three days before Christmas. Um, I was given almost Jesus. Christmas and birthday. <laughs> Wait. Secrets out, yeah. So you went straight to metal. There was no like Backstreet Boys or anything in between or like some gangster rap. You went straight to metal. <laughs> well, I, I grew up in a household that Although instruments were not around, a lot of music was being played. My dad was into, you know, all the classic rock. My mom really loved Motown. So, uh, yes, my so I was I was a fan of music early on. Um, but Metallica was my first. Uh, you know, was that was my introduction to like heavy rock or, or metal. And uh, was that just for MTV, bro? I was a, an avid. MTV <laughs> uh, watcher as well, yeah. Like, so so there, whatever there wasn't they, like a they were or like, playing. you know, a friend or something that in, that specifically got you into it. You just came across it. No, no. I guess MTV was that older brother for me. Yeah. And you're an only so, child, right? You're an only yes, child. Yes, I'm an only child. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so around eight nine, you got into Metallica and Justice for All, and your parents got you a kit. Yeah, after a few years of pleading and, and uh, you know, faithfully practicing on my uh, practice pad and synthesizer kit, they uh, they got me a, a Pearl Export. It was a five-piece and uh, two Zildjian cymbals and a cooler as a throne. <laughs> so like a like a good enough kit to get you going? Like a Absolutely. One, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's rough. And like... Were you, so for a couple of years you were playing, in fact, was there, like, how was this in relation to your, like, your social life in school? Like, was there friends that were getting into, because you know, you hear the story that people get into it, they have, like, other friends or, like, people in their school getting into it. 
was your school like a musical environment or was this just your own thing like was it cool to be a drummer or like you know was it like something odd or it was a little different yeah we weren't i mean i come from a rural area so there weren't a lot of kids in general in our school and uh but i do have a vague recollection of um i was i was never like a band nerd i didn't, didn't even join marching band until uh my 10th grade you know when i was well into high school but uh we did have like a band class like a general music class that we would go to and we would you know they would distribute recorders or they would make us sing or whatever and i do remember there was a drum set and uh at one point i don't know if this guy had been taking lessons or uh he just pursued it on his own but it was this fellow named anthony and he got on and played and uh i don't think i've ever told this story but yeah i, I remember being pretty struck by that but it definitely didn't make as big of an impression as as Injustice for All did. That was just like, that was a turning point for me. And I don't remember what age this was that that I saw Anthony play. Uh, he just got on and you know played some really simple beats, but it sounded so cool and looked cool. Cool. So like like so, so um, you were first like attracted to it. You felt something like on the screen with Metallica, and then once you saw it in real life, with your with your teacher Anthony playing, then it sort of had an extra effect on you he was a student actually he was a kid okay. like my age in class yeah so um oh shit so you weren't even the first drummer bro there's another kid <laughs> he beat I, you to it i was just uh elaborating on on your question you know it wasn't it wasn't really a like a musical a strong musical environment or community um but yeah once i got a kit eventually other kids started pursuing other instruments on their time you know that i found eventually found a uh, a kid that played bass that i tried to jam with a few times but uh nothing really i did nothing panned out i didn't really have my first bands until shortly after i graduated high school uh, what age would that be i graduated when i was 17 so I'm like 18 is when i got into my first band and how serious were you like like, were you like fully dedicated from day one or was there like a, a point where you're like, okay, this is my thing. I'm going to like ramp it up. Or was it just like you were just ready to go from day one, like always putting in the hours? Like, were, were you pretty good in high school? Yeah, I, I was, I mean, I was decent, you know, but, I, and my, I was inevitably, uh, I had to, dic you know, dictate some time to, uh, to schooling <laughs> so uh my drum pursuit was kind of hampered by that but as soon as i graduated high school it was just like i found a job just a, a dumb day, day job and all my other time was devoted to, to drumming it was just like a full-time pursuit and uh yeah i mean i got i got to a certain level and then i realized that <laughs> my time kind of stunk and i got married to the click and this was like the mid to early 2000s but prior to that I, I had been in a several local slash regional bands and uh and it was uh, even back when in high school when i was trying to form my first bands um it was it was something i was gung-ho about for sure you know like i had names for songs in my mind and lyrics and other <laughs> dumb shit that just would sound really stupid nowadays but um but i was you know i was passionate that's my you was ready to go point. basically from a young age yeah and as soon as i found these guys when i graduated high school they were in the same position they they had just graduated and they just had dumb day jobs and they just wanted to play music all night and that was my first real opportunity to be creative in a you know have a vehicle for that creativity rather than just aimlessly shedding on the drum set or playing along the music so after high school, uh, you found some people who were in a similar boat to you and who wanted to do music and who had day jobs during the side. And that's when you f first started experiencing like the having the band experience where people were a bit more serious and you could sort of build something. Is that correct? Mm hmm. Yeah. OK. And at this point, were. 
I would say they were they were as passionate as I was, but they weren't as serious. Okay. Like I was ready to to give up anything, you know, to pursue it. But it's that balance, man, of passion and doing the graft as well, right? Sorry. It's that yeah, balance yeah. of the passion and matching it with the graft as well, like putting in the time in to right. You know, because if if it was just about passion, everyone would do it, right? Right. So like absolutely. You know, you're you're from the East Coast, right? Mm-hmm. What was this scene like during this time? It was actually a pretty good time because we had this tiny little microcosm of a music scene. And, uh, so DC East Coast area or just... I'm even further detached from that. I'm in Southern Delaware. I'm close to a, a popular little tourist attraction called Ocean City, Maryland. And um, yeah, Sounds like fancy. in that area... Oh, it's Ocean uh, City, Maryland. Yeah. Bro, uh, I, I swear you lived in Shelbyville, bro. Oh, so we have to edit that out. <laughs> but, <laughs> Don't want some fucking stalkers. But Sorry, bro, if continue. Only, if only it was Shelbyville. Yeah, I know. I get that joke a lot. Uh, but because it's like a a beach, a beachy sort of tourist uh, uh, locale or, or uh, destination, uh, there's a lot of cover bands like there's a very strong cover band scene, but that never interested me I always wanted to do original stuff so uh, Despite that there was little scenes cropping up like around here and and there's another town called Ocean Pines and then uh, Salisbury, Maryland there was a scene and we all just sort of you know would book DIY style shows at like Elks Lodges and and uh, similar areas and uh, we would all congregate and it was a cool little time and then everyone grew up and <laughs> got day jobs and and then i invested in a home studio and you know went on and continued music okay so would you say like during that period there was like a couple of years where you were like sh- struggling to make things happen everyone was going for it and then people um got burnt out and decided to move on to other things and you kept you kept focused on music is that accurate? Yeah, I guess it's fair to say. I, I was early on. Life weeded out the pussies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I would just I just played with whoever wanted to play really, and then eventually I found I found my footing. I guess you could say. And uh, I was in a lot of bands with Taylor Larson. He was like my my uh, perennial collaborator in those days we were in like i don't know three or four or five different bands together and then he coincidentally also got involved in uh home recording and struck out and started his own bro, bro we'll get there we'll get there i'm still i still want to focus on the I, I'm, 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 I'm building into a origin when story he, origin story when he yeah when well when he started uh you know, kind of getting out of the, the, the band thing and getting more into the DIY recording, uh, that's around the time when I joined Periphery. What age was that? Uh, that would be 2006, so I would be 23. So between 17 to 23, that was like that struggling, the sort of DIY kind of era. Right, yeah, just lots of local, regional gigs. Um, before we continue, did you ever consider, because you know you had the day job, did you ever consider um, doing the whole um, cover band thing? Because, I mean, some of those gigs can be quite good paying. I did a couple of those, just because I, I, just through gigging and teaching in the area, I came to know several people, and at one point one was offered to me. It was just like a one-off thing. Um, and I did it and it, it was, you know, fun enough and I made decent money, but, um, no, it never, it never occurred to me really to, to strongly pursue that because it's just, I don't know. Did you have, were you doing the same thing? Like your side hustle that you were doing then that you're doing now? Uh, on and off. Okay. Yes. So but I, think- I, I did, I, I've, I've done everything, you know, I've worked in a restaurant I was a security guard. <laughs> I mean, I've done a bunch of shit. Well, this is before you were a hench, so, right? Yeah, before I was hench. Pretty hench, yeah. bad. <laughs> I was the, you know, a very ineffectual security guard. <laughs> okay, bro. So, look, before we get into the whole periphery thing, because I feel like that was probably when things got a bit, like, 
more serious for you. They sort of leveled up in seriousness. Like you say, Metallica were your influences. Who else would you say were your influence back then? Like who who were you modeling and like taking influence from? My first super drummer influence, if you will, uh, was Dennis Chambers. He's a gospel guy, right? I get people kind of affiliate him with that, but to me, he's always been a fusion guy because he's played with like John McLaughlin, um, Mike Stern, tons of people. What's up? Give me one sec, bro. Just put my <laughs> Wi Fi extender on to get more power up in here. Nice. Alright, bro. Dennis Chambers. Through the power of editing. We can... <laughs> Don't worry, bro. No, yeah. Nothing happened. So, who are your influences? <laughs> So yeah, Dennis Chambers was, he, yeah, I mean, he's affiliate, kind of affiliated with that scene, but I've always regarded him as more of a fusion guy because he's played with so many people in that niche of music, like John McLaughlin and Mike Stern, but he's played with everyone. I mean, he's, he's played with Carlos Santana. Uh, he's played with Funkadelic. I think that's how he got his start actually. Um, but uh, strangely enough, that was the first drum video that I ever bought was Dennis Chambers, it just for some reason that, that called out to me. And so he was my first, like I like, I, I like to say, super drummer influence because he just like went <laughs> well and beyond the call of duty when it came to, to playing drums, you know? He was just this unimaginable talent and still is. I, I've always put on the brakes to check out what Dennis is up to. So yeah, that was a big one. And then when I got out of high school, I got more into jazz, fusion, avant-garde stuff. Uh, I really love the band Screaming Headless Torsos. <laughs> Screaming and, Headless uh, Torsos? Correct. Okay. And uh, actually, a little bit before I graduated high school, I, I uh, got to know Virgil Donati, who ended up becoming a massive influence on me. And uh, so... So let me. I'm just trying to think of it. So you're a metal guy, right? At this point, young, and you, you're like. I, mean, I wouldn't say I'm a metal guy because Metallica. No, back then, like, back back then, before you joined like, Periphery. Metallica was like the hardest thing that I had listened to. I was more into rock, like, you know, Nirvana and. But, but also, bro, and... I know from a previous conversation that you like death, and Origin, so like, yeah, I mean... I'm trying to like put put the the picture together, like were you like i guess yeah around the mid 2000s is when i got into some of the more extreme stuff like death and origin a brief stint in death metal a very brief okay. yeah i hate eternal i had a couple of their records uh i would like to check more of it out i just i'm just not really into that phase right now i guess fair enough bro <laughs> but like players like dennis chambers you say and Vin uh, virgil they sort of they took you to a different place is what you're saying also, David Garibaldi of Tower of Power. Okay. And he was a, he was another big one. And so you were always open to different styles. It wasn't just like you were a metal guy and then you saw these drummers and then they took you, they inspired you to go elsewhere, or were you just always, you know, you're just like looking for different things. Yeah, always looking for different things. It was never, uh, I don't know, an elitist or anything. It was just. Whatever grabbed me. You really? You you were never an elitist, not even for like one summer. I feel like you would have been an elitist for like a little bit. I guess, you know, like in the late nineties, early two thousands, I, I had a burning hatred for like boy bands and bubblegum pop. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't in their when they're seventeen and you know, <laughs> listening to jazz and Frank Zappa and shit. Yeah, bro. Good. Let the hate flow through you. <laughs> All right, bro. So, seventeen, twenty-six, you know, and then, sorry, twenty-three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, how did you be periphery? Okay, so uh, I was coming to Taylor's house to pick him up for band practice one time, and he shouts dude check out this band they sound like Meshuga. and what had happened is they had added our band on myspace as friends and uh this is your band with with, with your friend taylor okay yeah um and i think it was the walk 
an early demo of the walk that they had up and uh i was you know i was pretty struck by it i was like damn they they do sound like it but they kind of have their own thing too and it's just it's just cool you know it was before everyone had a home recording set up and it was just kind of crazy to hear programmed drums that that sounded that way <laughs> so i was struck by that and and uh you know the production in general so uh it just you know kind of floated around in the back of my head and then maybe i guess about a year year and a half later taylor struck out to do his own thing and then i was without a band for the first time since i graduated high school and uh and then it just re-entered my my thought process or my my stream of thoughts like oh yeah there's that there's that periphery band let me check them out and when they initially added us they uh they didn't have a drummer i remember reading their myspace wait so so he they added you as their top friends on myspace i don't know if we were their top friends oh, but they added but you as friends yeah they okay. added us and i i don't recall that, that they had a drummer at that time but when I checked them out later, it said that they, they were working with someone. And, but I still took it upon myself to contact Misha. He had his AOL Instant Messenger of readily available on the MySpace page. So I uh, hit him up through that and you know just introduced myself and sent him some clips, some drum solo clips and some stuff I had recorded with some bands. And he was like, wow, you know. This is, this is badass. You should audition because I think the guy that they were working with just, I think he was a, a good drummer, but it, he just had a lot going on personally and he wasn't able to devote what it took to really play those songs. I think it took somewhere like a year for him to be able to play some of that stuff, like be able to jam it live in person in the jam spot. So he... I think he sent me the walk and I transcribed that and shot a video of it and sent it to him. It wasn't even like, it was like on a, not even on a dedicated like digital camera or like a DSLR or anything. It was on a, a cheesy digital camera that just happened to also capture video. <laughs> so super low fi production value, <laughs> but I sent it to him and he was pretty blown away regardless. And then, uh, he said, okay, learn letter experiment as well and come to, uh, I think they were in Columbia. Yeah, Columbia, Maryland for an audition. So I learned letter experiment and made the drive up with my kid. How long is that drive? Uh, it was two and a half hours from here. Set up, met the guys, ran through the songs and that was it. I had the gig. What was the vibe walking into that first rehearsal room? It was a totally different lineup. I mean, the only guys or the only guy that's still in the band from then is Misha. Um, the bassist was a guy named Tom Murphy. Uh, they had two other guitarists at that point, Alex Boyes and a guy named, I want to say Tony Mars was his name. And um, because even back then, Misha, I think he wanted to he started out playing drums in the band, but he wanted to eventually move to guitar to complete the three guitar, you know, setup. Uh, but they just didn't have, you know, the best luck finding anyone. So, um, with me in the picture, yeah, they, they had the, the whole setup and they had the vocalist Jacob tall. Um, so this is, you were 23 at this point. Yeah. And you were in periphery for five years? No, not that long. It was about two and a half, I believe. Only two and a half? Yeah, yeah. I really? left in early early 2009. Mm -hmm. okay. I joined in uh, like late summer 2006. So a couple of years. Despite, despite what the wiki says. It says I joined in 2005. That's not accurate. <laughs> so you know that's where I got my information from. So... Yeah, what, what, it says... I thought you were there for like four or five years. Oh, yeah. No. So I'm going to try and like bring in some some technical aspects now because I know you've got um, a specific drum setup, right? Mm -hmm. uh, was this 
did you come up with this during this time with Periphery before or afterwards? It was actually the band before Periphery. I uh, I was getting into stuff like Origin and Hate Eternal and shit like that. You checked out Death Metal and you come back with a few more notches in your belt. <laughs> well, I had uh, it, an interest in you know developing foot speed became a pursuit of mine, and I figured just to get to give my left foot a fighting chance, you know, I just simply need to use it more. And at that time, Thomas Lang uh, was really flourishing on the drum scene. And I noticed that he had this setup where he had a legless hi-hat stand, but uh, his hi-hats he just kind of used as color. They were like two bells on top of one another, so they made a really interesting, distinct sound. But I thought I could take that concept and, and apply it more like Mike Mangini, who uses the cymbals to, to, uh, to complement like progressions and and just complement the music melodically rather than just different colors. So I uh, took that concept and implemented it and at first I just it was just like two 13 inch hi-hats I didn't really pay much mind to like the pitches or anything I just it was a real more so mechanical decision to stress my left foot and I also implemented it in a band that was pretty the drum parts were pretty simple um, it was like a local pop thing, and uh, <clears throat> they had some material out before I joined, and then when I joined, um, you know, it wasn't so as easy. So, like, anyway. you were experimenting with different um, drum setups prior to joining Periphery, just as a drummer, right. you, you were doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so. But I had like the sig with this pop thing. That's when I implemented like what's I guess known as like my signature setup. So for people who aren't drummers, and, and, and then I carried that into periphery. So if you're not a drummer, basically the Orbiter has this uh, pretty unique setup where before we started working on this album, it just looked like symmetry. It felt like you had like two, like the same kit on the left and the right. It just felt like this mathematical thing, you know, which mm -hmm. obviously lends itself to this kind of music. Um, you've made videos about this and you've spoken about it. Is there anything you could add about like how you use this? Because it looks cool, but when it comes to practical application, it yeah, it definitely there. It lends itself to to more you know to complementing what I do visually, which is an unattended positive. But uh, I set out once once I developed more of a. A love for Mangini's playing and his approach, I, I set out to kind of use it in the manner that he does, in that most of my lower pitch symbols are on the left and the higher pitch symbols are on the right. So I can complement the music strategically, you know. So it's just like organization, basically. Okay. All right, bro. So, so you're in periphery, and a couple of years. Talk about that experience. What was that like? Well, initially it was... This is before album one, before P1. This is when um, yeah, there's a bunch of demos. Much. Sorry? Very much, in its very much in its infancy, and we just had like a small internet following. Well, I, I think it was quite a large following, man. A lot of fans from the early days. But this is before was... any official like thing happened, when the band was still growing, right? Yeah, uh, all the... There was, you know, the the bulb sound click. There was the MySpace page, and then Misha had a very active presence on the Meshuga forum, and I guess the Seven String forum. I don't, I didn't, I, didn't, <laughs> I don't remember everything he was involved in, but through his uh, his badgering, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> through all of his posting and you know, just our general presence online, we developed a. a fairly developed fan base but it wasn't to the point where it would translate you know um to like well, I mean, it was, selling uh, out I selling out venues it was or anything it's pretty good for what it was man like prior to this sure. there wasn't really a band that sort of you know was building a buzz from forums and stuff was there i'm i'm not sure but i'm just trying to give context like I, as to when i was in the band like it it was very much in its infancy so yeah it was really really rewarding, really satisfying at first, um, because it was a totally different approach 
from what I was privy to. Like I, prior to joining that band, I, I wrote all the music in bands with Taylor, just jamming in a room together. And so out of that very organic process comes this very mechanical process for like, here are these drums, they're already programmed, can you replicate them? So whereas you come from like jamming in the room, the old school, the classic writing process, you came to mm -hmm. this new situation where the composition was done to an extent and then handed you for you to add upon. How did I what? Uh, like the songs were written to, mm -hmm. to a point and then given to you as opposed to written from the scratch from the beginning, right? It was a different setup. Right. There were little pockets where it was kind of, I don't remember if it was uh, made known directly or just kind of like um, postured to me that I could kind of flesh it out on my own and do what I wanted. Like in the walk, you know, there's the guitar solo section where it's kind of like the drums and the guitar go off and do their own thing. And I, I kind of, I could take the hint that, you know, my input was wanted there. But other than that, it was initially, it was just like, um, you know, the band wants to learn this song, this Bulb song. So, you know, we want to turn it into a periphery song. So can you transcribe this? So I would transcribe it and try to learn it as best I could within a week or whatever and make the drive. I made the drive weekly to Columbia. Two and a half hours, five hours. Two, two and a, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> and, uh, and then we would jam and then I'd go back home that night. So bro, I want to kind of like dig deeper on this because, you know, for a lot of people who aren't in bands, you know, being in bands with people and the whole social aspect of a band is a huge thing, right? And so yeah, I'm just curious absolutely. and especially like, when you joined this situation, like, were you looking, f were you just excited about the music and you wanted to be a part of it? Or was there any kind of communication whereas, okay, this is um, what I'm bringing, like from you, was there any discussion with Misha or whoever was, you know, there about what your roles would be, how much you'd be, how much space would be given to you for you to, you know, be creative and express yourself and how much of it was to be, you know, a part of the band that kind of thing. Was there any kind of communication there or was it just excitement, you're in a room and then it's happening? Initially, yeah, it was more so just being excited about the music. And I, I was, I really liked Jacob's voice, Jacob Tall, who was the vocalist then. He had a really boisterous, really commanding scream and uh, interesting lyrics. And so I was just excited about, and also I was, you know, like I had mentioned, I was without a band, so I was just excited to be jamming with some. Getting back on it. Yeah, getting back on the whole, the old horse, but um, but yeah, like I said, it was initially fun because the music was the most challenging music I had ever played at that point, and uh, and it was because it was a different process, it was fresh to me. And it was fun to to nerd out and transcribe things and uh and eventually you know i started taking more and more liberties and writing my own parts and then uh eventually i would go over to misha's apartment and we would uh <clears throat> we would program things together like you showed me how to use drum kit from hell and i would program my ideas into it and then it it started to get to a point of like because we were still posting demos but they were still Misha's ideas so it was like well I already programmed the drums like why aren't we using this draft of the drums and then that be that became a contention and then that was uh you know rectified they started using my my drum ideas in the uh in the demos that we'd post on on MySpace and whatnot go on well I so like so you join the band you're working, you're doing your thing. And then there comes a tension point of when it comes to how much, cause at this point, Misha is like pretty much doing everything, right? And, but he, he wants to move forward with the band. So you as a drummer, you want to get your teeth in it and see a part of you within this thing that you're dedicating, right. your, you know, your energy to. So that's when there came a bit of tension. And then, but you was able to work through that and then get your ideas across. Is that what you're saying? Right, yeah. And then it just, like very small steps were being taken and 
at a leisurely rate. <laughs> but um, what was stopping? Uh, why, why was that like that pre professional period so long? I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, Misha was just in his comfort zone and that's, that's how I preferred to work. And but I also you know, understand there was like a lot of lineup changes, right? With like singers, you guys had like three or four singers, right? Yeah. Well, actually, as as not long after I joined, that Tony Mars, I think his name was, that, that fella, he you're like name checking everyone, bro. Big up your crew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can't remember if he left or they they gave him the boot or not. But would that have been a, would that have been a collective decision or were you too fresh at that point? I was very much too fresh. <laughs> um, and then Jake Bowen entered the picture not not terribly long after that. And then, yeah, eventually we parted ways with Jacob and we started working with Casey Sable, who I can't remember how, I think maybe he was a fan of the band and contacted Misha through the internet or something. I don't, I don't really remember how we came, you know, came in contact with him, but yeah, we started working with him and, uh, he was in the band for a while, but he, he only wrote for uh, Icarus Lives and one other song and then a couple melodies for Letter Experiment. And uh, he just, I don't think he really enjoyed being in a band and he didn't didn't want to tour. So, so basically, just... uh, this was still like a weeding out process, basically, where people were sort of realizing themselves, okay, you were trying to do it and people were realizing, oh, if do I really want to do this? And you're still struggling to get a core group of guys together. Yeah. Yep. That's fair to say. Okay. So was the album finished and you were just going through singers or was it still being written at the moment? By the way, bro, like in post, um, we can edit this. We can talk about how we're going to edit this. I'm just going to try and ask all the questions that I think people would want to know about. And then if okay. you, at post, if you think the periphery section is just too much, we can edit out or whatever. Okay. Well, um, we're going back quite a while. So I'm trying to remember this sequentially, but I think we initially wanted to do an EP and, uh, but then we scrapped that idea and decided to do a full length, which had a substantially different track listing than what, than what ended up being uh, their debut. Actually, one of my solo tunes was going to be on it. <laughs> uh, Jake Bone was going to flesh it out. But um, so you still there? I, I lost your visual. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. So. Um, yeah, um, touching back again on the, the whole tension element, um, there was a point where we had a band meeting and I stressed that I didn't want demos with program drums anymore. And unfortunately that was not honored. So that was something that, you know, obviously kind of rubbed me the wrong way and stuck with me. So you wanted, you wanted Misha to um, give you songs without any drums? Correct. Yeah, so that, that was my request, but unfortunately it was uh, was not honored. And uh, obviously it kind of rubbed me the wrong way and it stuck with me until I eventually took my egress from the band. Egress! But, uh... <laughs> but before we get, get into that, um, yeah, so I think we wanted to do an EP, and then that was scrapped, and then we wanted to do a full length, and then that's when I kind of made it another ultimatum. Like, I don't want program drums on our debut album. I want, you know, I've sank like two years into this band and however many hours I want to be, I want to record, I want to record the drums. And, uh, at that point, um, was cost an issue? Had... Sorry. Was cost an issue? Like, could you guys afford to, to go to a studio at that point? Well, it was decided that everything would be done DIY except for the drums, but um, I had to agree to some pretty outrageous <laughs> terms. 
terms like if the recorded drums did not sound better than the program drums and they would have to take a back seat and i also footed the bill for everything okay so it was not a uh, a pleasurable experience but uh when we decided that we would use real drums um at that point i had worked with a producer engineer named paul levitt and he knew brian mcturnan and he could contact brian and uh, get me a, a decent rate for uh, recording drums and you know he gave me a rate over I think it was like three or four days I would have to track and uh, get sounds and then the drums would also be edited so I'd have the full package ready to go and then uh, so we were going to do that and then Misha emailed the band and said Mark Lewis from Audio Hammer wants to do the drums and he can match McTernan's rate so that won everyone's favor because audio hammer was i guess as a production unit or team they were more well known in that niche of music so um Street cred. we agree yeah and oh I, actually i got a little more time as well i got a full work week rather than three or four days so i agreed to that and um paid for it and drove down to florida track the drums and I got sent back. I didn't know anything about recording at this time. So I got sent back with um, multi-tracks, not, you know, not uh, mixed stems. So we got the, the, uh, the files and we were just like, <laughs> what are we going to do with this? <laughs> like we wanted to sound how it sounded when we were in your studio. And then uh, that became another issue. Like, Mark said that he would mix it, but it would cost us this amount. And then Misha asked me if I would pay for that. And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> like, it's pretty ludicrous that I had to pay for it myself in the, to, to begin with. And so that was a whole thing. And then around this time, I had been um, corresponding with who was then the front man of Sky It's Airplane, who was a massive Periphery fan. And uh, I put together... A video for their most difficult song on their uh, album at that point it was a self-titled release it's called machines and I, I just I don't know I just kind of wanted to challenge myself and I also wanted to test some uh, recording gear that I had been investing in and I know I'm kind of all over the place here but um, yeah so bear with me but yeah, so, so, so the but, singer from Sky so Airplane he reached out to you he made a connection with you and once you check them out, you're like, all right, I'm going gonna... to... Well, he he reached out to me. Um, I think just to express his, you know, uh, admiration of the band. And I was... I had been running the Periphery uh, merch store at that point, like our little big cartel store. And Misha was like, dude, send him a shirt. He'll, he'll wear it in, like, interviews and shit, and we'll get huge. <laughs> so uh, I sent Jerry a shirt... And, um, uh, I don't know if we had any other correspondence, but obviously after I did that video, the machines video, I hit him up and showed him and he was like blown away and, uh, he shared it with everyone else in the band and Zach, the guitarist, Zach Ordway was also blown away. <clears throat> so I think he mentioned it. Oh yeah. Cause I think I made the video around the time, uh, their drummer left. And so, yeah, he was like, he opened up that door. He was like, would you ever have any interest in, in joining the band? Go ahead. Did you, like, was there, so things are, are a bit tense in Periphery. And mm -hmm. you make a new friend with the singer of Sky It's Airplane. Did you know at the back of your mind that, okay, I'm going to, like, are we just, that because they don't have a drummer. Was that something that was on your mind then, or did that develop afterwards? Well, when Jerry initially contacted me, they had a drummer. Okay. So you weren't you weren't cheating on anyone? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I wasn't cheating on anyone. I don't remember if I made the Machines video before Kenny, their drummer, left or after. I honestly don't. I would. It's probably after. I was probably 
you know, itching to to make an impression. But uh, but then Jerry opened up the door. He was like, "Would you ever have any interest in joining?" And I was like, "I really need to reflect on that because <laughs> I put a lot of time into this band and got a lot of money, and I don't know. My, my thoughts were a mess at that point." But um, so before we continue, bro, I just want to clarify. So you guys uh, had an album written, and you had recorded the drums with Mark Lewis from Audio Hammer. And mm -hmm. you'd paid for that yourself, and the drums mm -hmm. weren't as they weren't up to scratch, and that and you guys were, were there. That's what you had with you. Is that correct? Well, they sounded great when we were recording them, but they were being run through. They were being processed through all those plugins and whatever else that he you know normally used at that time. And then I got back with the multi tracks with rather than mixed stems, so you know it just. It didn't sound didn't sound sexy. So basically, was that like a you know if you mix the album with me, it'll sound sick. If not, here's the raw stems or anything like that. I I guess I don't know. I don't, there there was there was weird tension between us, Mark and I. Um, uh, not on my behalf, uh, and I, I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want to. Uh, What's the word? Not impinge, but uh, I don't want to disparage him. <laughs> disparage. <laughs> Good choice. Yeah, I think I think that. Um... You know, this shit happens, bro. You know, this is jungle out here sometimes, and sometimes what, what, you know, what happened was, it, there's I a think strong what emotions. Was, like... Yeah, I think his manager just kind of agreed to something that that he wouldn't himself agree to. So there was there was a big workload here. I mean, we spent like two or three days tracking and then two or three days editing and at some point in editing he just kind of shut down like he wasn't his normal lively self and I had to like interject a few times like you know that's not that doesn't sound right you know <laughs> that the edit was wrong <laughs> and um but I don't think I mean I don't, I don't know I we were supposed to get mixed drums and 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 we weren't so but maybe his manager and and himself their definition of mixed or just you know wasn't on the same page or what but we got the multi-tracks and they didn't sound sexy and there was a shit ton of mics even like bottom tom mics so we just and, and none of us had mixed drums before you know misha had only mixed drum kit from hell stuff like samples so we had no experience in how to get them sounding uh, the way we wanted them to or at least up to snuff with what we heard in the studio so we were kind of at an impasse and then the sky's airplane thing came along how much did you pay for those drums for that drum session <laughs> well the drums themselves eighteen hundred dollars <laughs> but not in cloud not including uh travel expenses okay i mean did you have to take all, your whole kit from the east coast to florida yeah symbols hardware everything Okay, so you try to make some moves with Periphery. It sort of is above your guy's head at the point. And this guy's aeroplate thing comes up. And after you did that video, how did the whole exiting Periphery entering Sky's aeroplane thing come about? And also, I think, you know, because I remember that time as a fan. And Sky's aeroplane were, they were like, they had a pretty good buzz around them at the time. So paint mm -hmm. us a picture, man. Well, yeah, they had uh, they had put out this self-titled album through Equal Vision. They were doing well. They had been on Warp Tour. They had uh, they had offers to go overseas and start their first international touring bouts. And uh, and so Jerry asked me if I would ever have interest. I thought about it and through some encouragement from friends especially taylor like you need to give this a shot so taylor and i got together and we did another another video uh which is an interpretation of their song numbers and then that sealed the deal and jerry was like dude you're in there's no ifs ands or buts about it and before i i said okay i was like i want to be able to contribute creatively you know like this is one of the reasons that i'm leaving this band like i want to have input 
uh, into the songwriting, into the drums, and they're like, absolutely, like, the more input, the better, because uh, I don't think Kenny really did much in that department. <laughs> so, like, basically, you know, usual, the studio tension and, like, general band stuff aside, the main crux of it was you wanted more creativity within Periphery. That was the main yes. thing for you. Okay. Yeah. And, of course, you know, I was... I was, uh, you know, there was an opportunity as well. This band was actually making moves and all. So that that's like the sexy side of it. That's the alluring side. But the 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 deep, you know, soul crushing <laughs> truth was that I just wasn't satisfied creatively. Not anymore. You know, it didn't. That initial um, pleasure that I had derived from transcribing and and trying to recreate these impossible drum parts that that disappeared after you know like a year and a half two years of doing the same thing so i wanted i wanted to quench that and um and so yeah and that was one of the offers that they made to me like you know we want we want input it, it would be valued even uh lee duck the other guitarist in the band was like if you want to help with the lyrics because i like wrote all the lyrics in the last album like bring it on man so so you've got one situation like you were like you know i don't think a lot of people realize the work that goes on behind the scenes for musicians to make things happen you know mm -hmm. so nope. you know, when you were telling me about you know going to the studio and recording it and things just not you know you tr you're giving it your best and it not coming out as hoped i can really relate to that so you've got like a situation on one hand where you've been in this band you've given it your all money time energy love and it's as uh, it's not really moving forward and on the other hand you've got this band that's taken that step and they've gone on tour they've got an album out and they're open to your creativity mm -hmm. so then you took that's, that chance that's the picture see when you paint like that it makes because i feel like a periphery fan listening to it might just seem like oh why why has he done that move for oh yeah yeah people ask me in in person all the time if you know about my leaving like why'd you do it and do you regret it and this and that and i i try to sum it up as best as i can depending on the amount of time i want to devote to answering the question but um but yeah that's the picture and so i i took a couple days to myself where i just i i actually called people close friends like what do i do and damn near everyone was like you need to just you need to get out of this situation. You need to take that chance. So, I held a. It was yeah. So I held a. I told the guys I want to hold a conference call, and uh, told them, and it was it was painful. You know, some people stormed off. Some people. <laughs> Stole off a, a Skype call. Yeah. I'm out of here. <laughs> it was a straight up like, multi phone call, like not Skype. It was just on the phone. And uh, yeah, people got emotional. It was it was painful. It sucked. And it was. I think there was still like another little grace period where like, just think about it. Come back. And I was like, no, nah, this is it, dudes. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you make this very difficult decision mm -hmm. um, after really giving it your all. And so, you was there any talk of doing both bands? No. At that point in Periphery, we had, even though we were having that whole situation with the drums, we had just gotten Chris Barreto, the vocalist, after a very long search, like between him and Casey, there was, I think like a year elapsed, maybe even more, where we just, we couldn't find anyone. We had online tryouts and just about everyone was just laughably bad. <laughs> And uh, and then we did a, an instrumental tour. It was a really short, like one week long, and uh, happened to come across Chris and his old band. I think they were called Lamps Burning. And and yeah, we just you know uh, made it known to him that we were interested in an audition, and he made the cut, and we started doing demos. Before we chat about Chris Burrow, how long were you in a band with Chris? Before you quit. It was really short. Like, I, like I, six months or something? Three months? No. I, 
I don't remember. He 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 uh Didn't you get him in the band, bro? Sorry? Didn't you get him in the band? It was part of my encouragement, yes. Because I was just so sick of not doing anything and not being able to find anyone up to snuff. It was just like this guy sounds awesome. He sounds like Randy from Lamb of God. <laughs> um and he's a really nice, personable guy. Like, let's do it. So I think some of my encouragement definitely pushed us in that direction. But he was not in the band long at all before I before I left. A couple months, you know. So, a couple months, and then, uh, did you want to say anything about that era? Before we were talking about Scotty's airplane. No. Because you mentioned Chris, so I thought you were like gonna elaborate on that or like something with, with the dynamics or anything like that. Because I know on a separate thing, I know Chris took a long time with the vocals, but maybe that isn't our conversation to have. I do remember there, you know, it took some time, but I think uh, I don't remember if he was working with Misha directly or they were working, you know, through through the internet or what. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it took him a bit of time to, to find his footing and, and be able to, to do what he wanted to do. But all the demos he was cutting were, were sounding cool. But, uh, I didn't spend, I didn't spend a tremendous amount of time with him in person, no. So you make the jump, bro. So I made the jump. Periphery, uh, they want you. They want to keep you, but you've got Sky's airplane seducing you in this direction. Was that uh, was that like a, a jump on tour thing straight away? Like, what was that? How was that experience like? Pretty much, yeah. Um, I left Periphery in February of two thousand nine, and I think. We started the Sweet Brag tour in March. Sweet Brag? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sweet Brag. That was, it was Emma Rosa opening, and then us, and then A Day to Remember, who had just put out Homesick, which is like, I think their album that like really broke them. And then the headliners were Devil Wears Prada. So that's the kind of crowd it was. Yeah, it was an alternative press kind of crowd. <laughs> but it was the shows were did you crazy. feel did like, you feel every show every show but two was was sold out. And this was like a 6 week tour. It was long. Did you feel like how did you feel in that new scene? Was there a difference cuz was it just music or was it like a noticeable difference in like the kind of bands, the kind of people, the kind of people that turn up to the shows and stuff. The vibe. Well, with Periphery, I had only done two, like, little tours. They were very brief, and we played a handful of gigs, but they were all in the, you know, local or regional, like in the D.C., Virginia area. And prior to that, I had, I had no real extensive uh, touring experience, so... Sky's Airplane was my first real tour. So you're just on a different scale then? Yeah, totally. My first show ever was this big ass convention center in Texas, and it was like 4,000 people. <laughs> yes, bro. So it was, you know, straight, straight to the lions, I guess you could say. And the money was coming in? Like, were you doing your part time? Were you having to have a date? Day job, or were you able to commit fully to Sky Airplane? I was always working my day job, but uh, my first two tours that I did with them, I was paid as a hired gun, which was surprising to me because I was all in. You know, I was like, I want to, I'm in the band, <laughs> so it kind of took me aback at first. But um, but after those two tours, I didn't get paid at all, so. <laughs> I should have just stayed a hired gun. <laughs> so tell us what happened, bro. Because I felt like that was hot and then it, it just disappeared. Well, we did, 
we did the sweet brag tour then we did a headlining tour which you know coming off the success of the sweet brag tour was it was not uh <laughs> it was kind of discouraging ironic that they were not sweet brag too yeah um yeah it was uh the turnouts weren't the best well they certainly weren't up to sweet brag standards <laughs> Literally and figuratively, <laughs> but um, so we did that, and there had been some tension with Jerry, the singer, on and off, even before I, I had joined the band. And uh, after we did the headlining tour, we took a little bit of time off to let things cool down. And I think he started maybe entertaining the idea of joining other bands or playing with them. I don't I don't really remember what was going on, but we just heard some rumors about like, you know, he's not happy and and he may have other offers. So it just became this thing of like, are we gonna keep doing this with Jerry in the picture? And eventually he we uh, parted ways. And then that initiated uh, another vocalist search. <laughs> And at that point, um, you know, I was pretty discouraged myself because, like, I had just made this huge decision and, like, I'm already I'm not back to square one, but I've already taken a step back and it's just like... At this point, at this point, where was, was your last band, were, were they doing, were they doing well or were they still coming up? What was that? situation like um we had they had they were kind of still in the same place i think they had started touring more but they still hadn't released the debut they i remember the debut when it came out we were uh because that was 2010 and we were on tour and uh i think it was summer of 2010 i don't know i remember elliot was in the band elliot coleman in Sky's oh, Airplane. Uh, in Sky's Airplane, yeah. So, Bob, do you know what? I've always wanted to ask you this. Why didn't, hmm. why didn't Elliot sing for Sky's Airplane if you guys needed a singer? Wasn't he singing at that point? When, when Jerry and the band parted ways, um, there were a couple of people that entered the picture, and Elliot was one of them. Initially, he tried out as the front man, and... Uh, he had some great ideas. Obviously, he has a great voice, um, decent enough scream. But there was another guy from my and Taylor's past named Brian Zimmerman, who was also talented, and he wanted the same position. <laughs> so it was they were both just kind of it was weird. They were both cutting demos with Taylor. Like <laughs> Taylor would work with one, and then a few days would pass, and he'd work with T Elliot or. You know, it was weird, but, um, so we were kind of torn and, and then I suggested, <laughs> uh, to give our bassist the boot <laughs> and, and get Elliot on, uh, bass and backup vocals and let Brian front the band. So sorry about that, John. <laughs> I think he knows. So, um, so yeah, that became the lineup. So now you've got your back with a lineup in Sky's Airplane. Mm -hmm. Did you have management at this point? Yeah, we had the same manager throughout the whole thing. From the time that I had joined the band until its dissipation. Uh, we were managed by, I think her name was Bridget Wright. And, um, yeah, she had some big clout. She managed, like, Rage Against the Machine and other crazy shit. So you guys are ready to go, basically. Round two. Yeah, once... We didn't really... We didn't play any gigs or do any tours we immediately recorded uh, the sound of symmetry ep <clears throat> and then we did uh then we started touring I, th I can't remember it came out i don't know we may have done a short run before it came out but uh it came out pretty quickly like after we recorded it mastered it and all that why wasn't that an album um <sighs> was it a matter of just getting something new and out there asap I think so. Yeah. I think it was just, you know, a statement like this is where the band is at. 
and uh, I think we just wanted to get back on the road. I remember listening to that EP, bro, when it came out back in the day, and I really enjoyed the song, um, The Sound of Symmetry. Mm-hmm. And from speaking to you, I know that that's you wrote that song basically. <laughs> is that is that is that accurate or? No, no, that that was uh, see Zach is really the mastermind behind behind that stuff. Not not the first release, the super duper Nintendo core release, but the self titled that was just like that was a massive Zach expression. But we did collaborate on uh, on Sound of Symmetry. Like he would send me tabs, and because uh, I don't think he was, I don't remember him being into Guitar Pro. He was a big Reason nerd. That was his thing. That was his DAW of choice. But he would send me tabs, and then I would, I would, uh, you know, since I was fairly fluent in Guitar Pro, I would uh, plug in the tabs, you know, because I I knew what the rhythms were. And then I would, I manipulated some stuff, like I made some things odd time, and obviously I, I did my thing with the drums themselves, but I did manipulate a few melodies, and I contributed a couple lines lyrically as well, so even just with, with three songs, I had more creative input than my two and a half years of periphery. And so what happened with Scottie's airplane? So <clears throat> we got Brian and Elliot in the band. We did new lineup, new EP. Yeah, new new lineup, new EP. We did a small run, and then we did a really long tour um, with what's that band called? Drop Dead Gorgeous. <laughs> it was a co-headlining run. Sounds like a scene band. TVH. Oh yeah, very much a scene band. Um, really long run. It was like close to two months long. And then we had a little bit of time off, and then we did a traveling summer festival package called Scream It Like You Mean It. Also pretty lengthy. It was like a probably like a month, month and a half. And uh, by the end of that, we were just like, we can't do this with Brian anymore. He was just... Singers being long. Singers being yeah. long. Singers, man. Not had the best luck with singers in, in my career, but... Um, yeah, we couldn't. We just couldn't see it working with Brian anymore for numerous reasons. So, um, uh, yeah, at the end of that tour, we just kind of left him, like literally, just left him in the van. And <laughs> the next morning, we woke up and he was gone. And that was the last time I've seen him. But uh, from there, it was like there was a little bit of an impetus to keep going. Like, why didn't Elliot become the singer at this point? Growing it. We were throwing different ideas around, and one of them was Elliot possibly fronting the band, but I don't know, just nothing, nothing uh, had enough fire behind it to to pursue it. And then we also started doing other things. Lee Duck started his lighting company. Elliot eventually joined Tesseract. I was was it like so you come off the you like the singer he quits or I guess he quits right. You didn't kick him out. Uh, it was it was more so. I don't yeah, think both. he really wanted to quit. It was it was more so us kicking him out. Yeah. And like real life kicks in basically. And yeah. so your boy yeah. goes off and starts yeah. a company, and you just gotta like pick up the pieces, right? Because this thing is not moving forward. Right. <clears throat> and then you, you just fizzled out from there. Yeah, that's really the best way to 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 you know elucidate it just it just fizzled out zach was you know we he would write some demos and elliot would would kind of work work with it and you know do what he could and you know i was always open for writing drum parts or whatever but it was just like i said it just wasn't enough fire behind it and uh eventually it just we started doing our own thing individually on our own Obviously, Elliot and Zach still wanted to collaborate, so they did Zeliac, but... Uh, Internet project, right? Yeah, that obviously that wouldn't have worked as like a Sky Terror plane thing, so it just musically wasn't the same. Was there any talk of making that the main band, and you guys all playing in that band? 
Um, I think there was some loose talk of maybe trying to organize a Zeliac tour, but I mean that that that's a lot of moving parts and and we're dealing with the same guys that didn't even want to resurrect Sky's airplane, so it just it just didn't work out. You know, everyone and like I said, Elliot Elliot joined Tesseract, so that became his big focus and then I was doing home studio. But wasn't there like I'm pretty sure it's like Bro, I know we're gonna enter the session life in a sec, but I want to talk about wasn't there a band called the Empire? Yo, my uh, GoPro just turned off. I think it ran out of juice. Can you plug it back in? I'm gonna see. It's either run out of battery or it's uh, run out of hard drive space. <laughs> Well, probably, uh, let's keep it flowing. Let's keep it flowing. Like, was there a band called Empire that you were in? Like a hardcore it's not band? Not gonna be the same. No. No. Are you thinking of Crown the Empire? Wasn't that? I'm pretty sure there was a hardcore band that you guys were in. Like you, you like the the remaining members of Sky Sarah Plan were. Oh, you're th you're thinking of um of Legends. Legends. Okay, so it was like I remember it was like one word. Like a common word. No, it's 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 a weird name. It's called of legends. Okay, so tell us about that, bro. Was that that was post Sky Aeroplane? It was the majority of that band, but without the singer, right? Or the different singer, rebranded with a different musical style. Hold on, yo. Um, I don't. If I. Yeah, if I connect this, I can't record with it, unfortunately. So it's just gonna have to be audio only for this that's fine bro we'll just put like gorillas like dancing in the background or anything whatever yeah it's, it's, it's all good it's all good just put a stock photo of me <laughs> giving a thumbs up or something um so yeah of legends um okay that started as a, a lewis to book um side project who's lewis to book lewis had this um kind of sceney bro, pop wait. pop project bro, but who is lewis I'm, I'm getting there okay so <laughs> he had okay. this kind of like all press esque pop project called the secret handshake and uh when he was working on one of their records one of his and it's a solo project but when he was writing one of the records he was also concurrently writing the first of legends ep and uh, it was just like programmed easy drummer drums and like kind of genty riffs, but with like a hardcore kind of aesthetic, I guess you could say. So they put out this EP independently, and uh, people seemed to dig it. And he started writing a, a full length. And uh, I was on tour with Sky Eats, and our merch guy that works with Sky Eats also worked with Lewis in the Secret Handshake, and he told me about about Lewis, you know, writing this record. And I was like, hey, yeah, tell him I want to do the session drums. <laughs> so uh, that night I got a, uh, a you send it download like to the whole record and I started writing uh, writing the drum parts. And then I uh, recorded them at Taylor Studio. This was, uh, I think, early summer 2010. And then I immediately went on the road with Sky Eats. We did the Scream It Like You Mean It tour. And then uh, Lewis put out the album in, I think, I can't remember exactly, maybe late 2010. And then at that point, uh, also the Secret Handshake record came out. It was like this homage to, to Motown. Like he hired like authentic musicians and did everything with like a live band and tried to, and tried to make it like as authentic as possible. And unfortunately, it, it did not do well, or at least it didn't do as well as his previous releases. So he decided to just totally scrap the secret handshake and pursue of legends full time. And uh, so that's how I became involved. Like it started as a session for me, and that, that you know when he made that decision, Sky Eats Airplane was kind of dissipating. And I said, sure, I'll be your drummer. I May mean, as well. I already did the drums. <laughs> and then uh, he got. Elliot to do uh, to play bass live 
and then Zach to play guitar live. And so, and then we also got uh, a guy from Drop Dead Gorgeous, coincidentally, uh, Jacob, to play uh, the other guitar. And then, uh, so yeah, at that point we had a full lineup, and we did a tour with, um, who was it, Norma Jean, they were the headliners, uh, Stick to Your Guns, Impending Doom, uh, I think that's everyone that was on it. So we did that in 2011, and then uh, in the summer of that year we did another tour, and at this point Elliot was in Tesseract, so... So he left. He left this band to join Tesseract. He wasn't ever really considered like a full fledged member, I don't think. And uh, so he was in Tesseract, and we got, <laughs> strangely enough, coincidentally enough, we got John from who was who played bass in Sky Eights to play bass uh, on this tour. And then we just didn't was there any beef? He was like, "Bro, you got me kicked out, <laughs> and now you want me back." Beef. Yeah, strangely enough. Thankfully, <laughs> it wasn't awkward. It was cool, and uh, and we just didn't have a second guitarist, so it was just Lewis, Zach, John, and I. And we did a run with. Uh, it was only uh, like the first leg of a tour. Uh, I think we started in Vancouver, and made our way down. Um, who was that with? I think, yeah, Bring Me to Horizon. They were the headliners. Oh shit! And uh, Parkway Drive. Uh, some band from Australia called These Nuts. <laughs> they were on it as well. And so it's a pretty Blizzard. big tour then. It was. It was a big tour. So yeah, that was the end of that. And then Lewis um, moved from Dallas to LA to, uh, yeah, I think he had some some marital issues, not to be too personal. I think enough time has elapsed for me to say something like that, but uh Hopefully not being too personal, but um, had some marital issues and went to LA to strike out and, and be a producer. And start fresh. Started, yeah, start fresh. Yeah, and eventually also started another solo project called Mystery Skulls, which has seen quite a bit of success. So uh, yeah, uh, when I did that, I just pretty much went right back into what I had been doing with the session work and everything. So. Tell us about your session work, Puff. So you, you've spoken about Periphery, the bands before that, Sky Eats yeah. of Legends. Mm. Where does session come into all of that? Well, Taylor, when once we once I got over the fact that he didn't want to be in a band anymore, <laughs> we re- rekindled our friendship, and he actually convinced me to start investing in, in a home studio. Oh, you know, and he was doing it at the same time. So alongside him, we'd both be building these studios. And uh, so this is before Periphery. This was actually in the thick of Periphery. This was like I think two thousand, late two thousand seven was when I made my first massive initial investment in home studio gear, and I still have some of that stuff. Actually, my Neumann TLM one hundred three is I, I still have those. I got those from Guitar Center in Rockville, Maryland. <laughs> but um. So yeah, I started investing in stuff, and it's kind of reflected in my videos on, on YouTube. Like, you follow the, the sequence, as you can see, once I had amassed more gear, and like, the production values increased. But yeah, this is like 2007. Uh, I started investing in it, and initially I just used it to, you know, make my own videos, like, to videos of interpretations of Skype they're playing song interpretations of old my old interpretations of periphery songs and then eventually in march of 2010 i did my first professional gig out of it so we're going on a full decade now working independently from my home studio so you were you had like a rehearsal space and then out of um after being encouraged by your friends you decided to invest and actually turn it into a legitimate studio with like soundproofing and whatnot yeah, actually, when I started doing it, I actually really invested. So, in, is this uh, in your house or is it like outside, separate building? This is this is a separate building. So it's a, it's actually on my parents' property. It's my parents' house, and then there's a separate building with. Uh, it's actually a little bit bigger than houses. There's a garage. There's my mother's 
mother's business, her dog grooming business, and then my studio studio. And yeah, actually when I started, um, started at least entertaining the idea of it being a studio, I, I had a lot of work to do as far as like cleaning it up and getting it in shape because it just used to be like a jam spot, you know, it's my drums and whoever wanted to come hang out. So eventually I had to clear all the junk out of there and then I, I laid some, some hardwood floors and made it nice and acoustically spiffy and sexy. And, uh, and yeah, so then, then embarked on the, uh, has it been blue ever since then? What do you mean? The wall. There's that one blue wall in your studio No, uh, that I wish was like your cream or something to match your wood. At at first it was, you can see it in my old videos. It was, uh, it was orange, but not like bright orange. It was like a very subdued (laughs) orange, um, almost like, like more of an earth tone. And then, um, and then yeah, uh, I went away for a, a tour. When was it? It was like this is 2015, so it would have been a, a tour of Darkest Hour. And uh, my mother took it upon herself to repaint those. It's not like wait. Two so your mom, your mom snuck up with a with a bucket of paint and repainted the studio <laughs> while you were away. Yeah, it's only <laughs> two, wall, two walls that have paint, so it's not like you know. A, massive job a massive undertaking but she took it upon herself to get a, a new coat so it turned from orange to blue of the tour <laughs> but i i dig the blue more it's it's nice that's pretty funny bro so yeah. it's studio bro in the thick of periphery yeah. you're building your studio you get your first client uh is this uh and is your friend giving you these clients? Is he referring you? Are you? Ha- What's the money like? Are no. you? I mean, uh, Taylor would get me work, but out of his home, out of his own, you know, respective studio, you know, out of mine. Um, all the work that I've ever gotten has just been through word of mouth, through the internet, really. And uh, that's how I got my first client. He's seen some of my videos, and and I guess. Let me see. Maybe, maybe I still have the email. Let's see. I doubt it. No, I'm not seeing it. I can't. I was trying to recall if he asked me if I did session work or if. I'm, I'm just trying to remember how it came about. Where I was like, where I offered to record it on my home studio. But I mean, I, I had enough gear to make it happen. So I think I just made the offer. Like, a, I can just do it here, and you know, it'll sound decent enough. And and that's how it all started. So after that first one, seeing that you could do it and make it happen, you it beca- you sort of started thinking about it more and it became a thing. Yeah. yeah I mean, I just, at that point, I had... Like, were you thinking about becoming a session drummer? Or like, was it... Like, were you having, like, money problems? And you're like, okay, I'm going to be a session drummer? Or like, how did, you know? That was strangely enough never a pursuit of mine i always just wanted to play in bands and, and just you know just make music with people and uh once taylor started doing his thing and started getting either drummers that couldn't play to a click or projects that didn't have a drummer you know he would give me a recommendation and i'd start i'd come in and lay down the tracks and uh that's how it all started really and then that just carried on into the home studio environment. So as you were working on your like your band life, you had like a parallel life as a session drummer. So when you were off tour and like in your downtime, you'd be doing that work. Was it like quite frequent or was it like every now and then? Um, it was, uh, I was pretty, pretty gamefully employed. It was pretty constant. Uh, pretty consistent, yeah. And part of that was because <laughs> this is gonna sound silly, but I didn't know how to do punch-ins for like the for like oh boy, two and a half, three years of recording. I just you didn't know, didn't know how, you it. didn't know how to press spacebar. <laughs> it's more than that when it comes to drums, man. I know I know with guitar it's it's way simple, but with drums like. There's a lot of things to consider, a lot of moving parts, you know, lots of tracks, lots of mics. It's easy. 
it's easy. To, you may think it's easy to just like punch in, but you, it can sound really. Probably, you just really put the you just put the yellow quick. thing around the part you want to do. Give yourself some time and press spacebar. <laughs> well, I didn't know how to do that, so I would have. To Are you sure there wasn't a part of you that was like wanting to do it perfectly, like? Fuck this guy. I'm going to do it perfectly. No punch-ins. Like, extra, extra street cred. Like, you know, bro, I, did you hear about the story I, 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 of, about the Event Sevenfold drama? Apparently, the first EP that they did, he did it in, like, one take, the whole thing. And, like, it was it was like a thing where he'd go around town saying, yeah, yeah, I did the whole EP in one take. But then, like, as you listen to that, the EP or the album, like, in the last couple of tracks, it's, like, slopping up. But he did it for the clout. That's cool. I mean, that's more of like a, a classical musician uh, mindset, I guess. But um, but I would have to learn entire pieces, you know. And, and the only time I knew how to punch in is if, if the drums were tacit enough and the cymbals had died down, you know, then I could I could fade them and, and do a punch in. But if it was straight on through or if there wasn't enough of a rest, then I would have to track the whole thing in one go. So... <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I had a steady flow of work. <laughs> well, because you didn't know how to do punches. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, if, if I had like a four minute song, I would it would take me like two weeks to learn it. And now I can do that in like four days. <laughs> so, wait, so what you're saying is that because you didn't know how to use punch-ins, it made you become sick and you did a sick, you did a really good job. And so you had like... Um, your name was it was noticed and people would come to you for work is that what you're saying? oh I didn't advertise the fact that I I didn't do punches it was just it was just a byproduct of not knowing not no, no, no I'm, I'm saying like what, like what, what's the what's the how does not having not, not knowing how to do punches how did that relate to you getting work is what I'm saying or are you just like throwing out some random fact I'm just I didn't know punches man one of the reasons that I was so inundated with work was because I couldn't finish things quickly enough because I had to really devote some time to it, to like, you know, to the fact that I couldn't screw up. <laughs> but so, eventually... Which meant that you did a good job, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't mess up, <laughs> put it that way. Okay. But eventually I learned how to punch in, and that, that just made a world of difference in terms of just how much you know my output how much i could i could do and i'm very I'm very fortunate that i figured out how to do that i mean i'm obviously i can do a lot more now in pro tools but so um so after that was that was a hurdle for sure <laughs> so <laughs> uh so you've done you've done your bands and now how, how long is this period where you're doing the session work like after of legends um, after your guy moved to the west coast um talk about life between that to darkest hour was that session work or, or did you jump quickly to darkest hour yeah there was a period of time where it was just solely session stuff um the last of legends tour that little run with bring me horizon that was i think that was september 2011 and uh my, actually, my initial, my very first jam session with two of the guys from DH was in November of, of that year, but we, we didn't go on to, you know, being a, a, un, a unit till uh, May of 2013. So there was, there was some time there where it was just like session work, and then I would get together with DH guys, and we would do uh, pre-production. Like, we would, we did a lot of pre-production sessions um, leading up to the recording session for uh, the subtitle title record my first record with them and uh yeah 2012 was just dotted with it was pre-pro sessions so we would get together for a couple days and hash out ideas and it was just like um james taylor back in the day that's one of the things that appealed to me immediately about them because they were such fans of being in a room and doing things organically and was that like a we a hired gun for a while, or was it like a percentage of the band, like a fully fledged member? What was that like? 
coming into that band? Because yeah, they'd been going on for quite some time before you joined, right? Sorry? Because they'd been a band for a while before you joined. Oh, they were... God, I mean, this is the 25th year of the band, and I've been in since 2013, so... Let's see, let's do the math here. 18. So I've been in for almost seven years. So yeah, they're 18 years strong, the band. It's <laughs> a long time. But yeah, I did. Uh, we did a couple one-off gigs, and then like one weekend warrior thing where we played a couple gigs in, in Cali, and yeah, I was paid as a hired gun, and then then I joined the band. And, I mean, we still get paid, but we kind of pay ourselves like hired guns, so we can keep some money in the, the band account and all that stuff. Okay. But, yes, bro. So, we we've gone through. You've walked us through your career as a musician. Um, is at what point did you get into fitness, bro? Oh, fitness. Because as a drummer, it's a physical thing. Mm-hmm. Was it something you you were always conscious about, or was there like a point where you decided, okay, I'm gonna get a hench now? <laughs> Talk us about your fitness journey, I'd bro. Say, I'd say, like, I, I've been physically active. For a while, I guess I did Taekwondo um, for a number of years, got my black belt pretty early, I think I was like 13, and then uh, at some point in high school, I uh, I was just, I just kind of got sick of being skinny, because <laughs> I've been really skinny but lean, you know, low body fat percentage like my whole life, so I started started lifting then but I had no idea what I was doing and that basically that trend continued for a number of years and then uh, I think it was the 29 or the 30 I was like alright I really want to want to get bigger like I'm, I've been lifting but I need to like invest some time and, and figure out out a routine and get some bigger weights because I had like the same uh, I think I had like a pair of 20s and a pair of 40s at that point and uh, like I need to get some bigger weights and I need to do this so um, I went on I think I went on Amazon and I got a pair of 50s 50 pound weights dumbbells and uh, took advantage of their free shipping and then Wait, Amazon yeah, does free shipping. Me. Isn't that part of Amazon Prime? Or is it just free in the States? Um, it's, I'm not a member. I'm not like a Prime member. so. You just get free free shipping? Yeah. Bro, I pay <laughs> seven nine nine a month for free shipping. For Prime membership. That's yeah. that's messed up, man. I, don't yeah, even, I, still I, get, I still get free shipping. Like, for most things. So in America, it's just free shipping with Amazon. It takes longer, but who cares? <laughs> Especially when it comes to weights. God, you save so much money. Jeez. But uh, yeah, so I got a pair of 50s and started. What's your split, bro? Training more, more consistently, more intensely. Started training my legs. And, and uh, yeah, it's just been kind of growing in, in ever since in consistency and, and intensity. What's your split? As I've gotten. <laughs> See, I don't, I don't do splits. I don't. I mean, I had like. Like, what's the like? Four. What's the you know? You have in order to get hench, you gotta have some structure in your in your exercise in your workouts. So, like, what kind of? Uh, I'm sure you do, but I, 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 at this point, I train instinctually. So. I just live, man. <laughs> when I go in, it's just like, what isn't sore, or what have I not trained in a while? And that's what I adhere to for that session. How many days you do? I try to do it every day. I find that that, that is the best for me because if I take a day off or more, then it just it just gets harder and harder to get back into the groove. So even if I just go in and I just train like abs, which takes like ten minutes, then then at least I've done it and I can I can stay in that groove, you know. Sometimes it's more intense, you know, I'll do two a days or whatever. Um, but that's that's what I find works best for me. 
So no recovery days. There's recovery days. Just whatever, whatever I'm not working that day, that's recovery. <laughs> no pain, no gain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have it in, in the back of my head what I've trained. And I have the stark reminder of what is sore and what isn't. So that, that informs me. No joint problems do, and like muscle like injuries doing it every day. No, uh, I mean there's like really minor things, like uh, what is it? I forget the name of the, the the injury that I had. It's really minor, but it's just like pulled something weird in my back when I was doing a curl. So like I just stopped doing those kinds of curls. But it's it's like I said, really minor stuff. Um, just things that really just kind of impelled me to change up my routine. It's probably what why I got it in the first place. I was doing the same thing for too long, you know. Mm. But yeah, nothing that uh, inhibited me for a long period of time. So, you, at some point, you just decided to get into weights and you just lift every day. Well, that so I got those fifties in like. I want to say late 2012 and uh, it sounds like I you took that, a blast beat approach to lifting bro I'm not sure if it's that good for you <laughs> well I mean because don't get it twisted I'm all about that beast mode and going for it but you need rest days bro otherwise how are you going to lift with maximum output well if your one day is just abs then Okay, so basically, so you got a full twenty four hours of recovery for whatever you didn't work prior. So would you call like just doing abs a workout? It's a workout for the abs. <laughs> so like, say if you lifted heavy for six days on Sunday, you didn't do anything but abs. That's that's what you're saying. That would be working out every day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that sounds less. That seems more reasonable. If he's like, yeah. no, bro, I just lift every day, no matter what. Yeah, no, I'm I, I'm not. By that, I don't mean like I power lift every it sounds, day. It sounds extreme, bro. It sounds extreme. Yeah, that would be too much. Then I would have issues, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, I got those fifties in late 2012, and um, like I said, started getting more consistent, more, more intense. Started training legs, and then it was actually the I remember this pretty vividly. It was the mayhem festival that we did darkest hour um that was summer of 2014 uh that was structured as such that i we would play like fairly early in the day and i would have that entire day and night to myself so i would just like work out like a madman in the sun in the parking lot switching parking lot <laughs> and that uh from then on i, I just i got I really consistent with it What did you do to switch off? Uh, like I said, just other muscle groups, really. No, I mean, because you're playing drums, you're working out, and you've got your side hustles. Like, when it's time to unwind and kick back, what's your, what's your routine with that? Like, how do you relax? How do you switch your mind off, switch your body off? How do you recharge? Pretty, pretty much like anyone else. Uh, you know, watch a movie or read a book. Right now I'm reading Malcolm X's autobiography, which is riveting. <laughs> yes, bro. I definitely uh, thought you would be into Malcolm X <laughs> when I looked at you, bro. So, bro, well, tell us. I, I, he he interested, interested me in that I pretty much knew nothing about the guy other than he was, you know, a people's rights movement advocate and he was a, a figurehead. So I, I wanted to learn more and what better way than through his own words. So. Do you know, are you aware of Martin Luther King's work? Does he? I'm assuming he has an autobiography as well. No, I'm not specifically an autobiography, but he was also um, an advocate for the civil rights movements. And oh, of course, yeah. And I mean, I was just wondering if you had, if you had, you were interested in the subject, and you decided to, you were 
attracted to um, Malcolm X's work over Martin Luther King or was it you were already aware of Martin Luther King's work and you wanted to expand your knowledge by understanding Malcolm X a bit further because they both were fighting for the same cause but they came from different angles um, right so I'm just curious yeah, about no, that I would say that uh, I wouldn't say that my uh, knowledge of uh, Dr. King is really any more extensive than Malcolm X but for some reason I don't know I just it just appealed to me to, to, to check out Malcolm so I uh, I'm reading that and uh it's a pretty dense book it's like 450 pages or something with the epilogue and foreword and all that so i'm like halfway through but uh Cause yeah that's one way for me to unwind at this juncture <laughs> Fair enough. are you in a relationship no sir so <laughs> I know you've got a. Uh, tell us about your side hustle, bro. Because at, at this point, in this kind of music, uh, most of us have side hustles. Right. So, other than uh, obviously session work, um, uh, I groom, I help my mother with her business. And she, like I said, she owns her own dog grooming business. And uh, actually, initially, started helping her way back when I was like six or seven years old that was my first opportunity making any sort of money was helping my mom so like, what is explain to us what a dog grooming business is because that seems kind of like something that I only know from watching Simpsons <laughs> like it's not really a thing like a, a common thing so yeah it's really common here in the states so what you you, you your, your mom gets dogs and she like she like gives them makeovers and for com competition well, it, or it, like for what? No, it depends on the, the breed and what the people want. Some people bring their dogs in because they. But is your mom like a dog pimp? Like is she like the middle lady? People come bring their dogs and they want to make specific breeds. Like oh, I've got this. I've got this. Let's put them in a bag and see what happens. No, no, no. That no, she is not a breeder. I mean, she has dog pimp bred some dogs yeah she has dog pimps but it is definitely not her focus it's not her main hustle i find it really jokes that your mom and like your the your side hustle is like dog grooming but you play like really extreme music <laughs> yeah i'm sure there's a joke there to be had sure <laughs> but uh yeah people just you know it, it depends on what the breed is and what the what the people want some people you know, they may have like a, a poodle and they want a, a fancy haircut. And some people just have a shaggy dog that they want shaved so, down. Pimp my dog. Yeah, pimp my dog. And some people have, they just want their dogs to be bathed because they smell bad or, you know, it's an assortment of things. That's so jokes, man. <laughs> That's so jokes. It sounds funny, but I mean. No, I'm not like, bro, work is work, man. And passion is passion. I'm sure your mumsy is a passionate lady. Which is why you're a passionate on the drums, but it's still jokes, yeah. bro. Like, I'm pretty sure I saw an episode of Simpsons where that happens, where Santa, Santa's <laughs> little little helper tries to become like a competition dog, and I don't know something happens and something happens, and it's all about heart, you know, in Simpsons, which is why I keep watching it, man. Right on. It's all about that heart. Well, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty popular. Uh you know independent pursuit here a lot of people have their own even in this area there's tons of dog grooming businesses is it a delaware thing like an east coast thing or is it like a usa thing no i guess it's just a usa thing <laughs> yes bro what keeps you, what keeps you going man hmm. well you're a busy guy at, at this point when it comes to music, you know, I, I do a lot of solo things, and uh, it's just, I don't know, it's like, uh, it's really enticing to just sit down and write a piece of music, and then usually I write in Guitar Pro, so you end up with this very 
pale imitation of what it can and could be. Um, That's your interpretation of it. I like to think of it as like uh, the blueprint or like the the truth, you know? Because music is just notes, right? And you take away the aesthetic of like the sweet tone is it's just a sound of like different shapes and spaces. So yeah, well, no, I agree. I agree with that assessment that it's like a blueprint, and you know, if it's if it sounds good, like on MIDI, it's gonna sound great with. Well, it'll sound much absolutely. better. Absolutely. You know. Yeah, I agree with that. But I also think you know that uh, it will be more than than what it is in Guitar Pro, and that's not just through the process of recording it but also what comes with that process you know any other ideas that that come to the surface as you're working on it so that's one of the things that's, that's really driving me today like it just because i've i started out just really just trying to bring really outlandish drum ideas to life and then it just and then it, carried over into like sound design and synthesizer production and and now mixing in general just like it's so so interesting and intriguing to see how all these elements come together to to form a composition and so i'm kind of reapproaching writing with that mindset you know what i've learned the past couple of years like doing my own mixing and and obviously recording drums so that's that's uh, compelling for me at this point. If there's a guy out there, there's a young you that wants to become sick at drums. What's it gonna take to be to be at your level? One of the biggest things that I've been a proponent of is education. Formal. Uh, sorry. Formal. Yeah, I mean. I learned a lot of things on my own, but, uh, and if you can teach yourself how to read notation, then great, but I had to learn, I mean, I learned really young, but I had to learn through, you know, private lessons, so once you know that, once that piece of the puzzle is there, like, it opens up so many possibilities, once you're aware of what you're doing, what you're playing, and not just kind of winging it, so to speak. Then uh, it, it, it it like it allows you to break the rules and know that you're breaking the rules. <laughs> mm, I mean, I'm gonna disagree with you there. I think you know I come from a hot perspective. Um, like I don't know much theory or any theory, basically. Well, I I do, but not. You know, in the traditional sense, and I think that it's just a freeing thing. Following my heart is gets there, like um, you know, in, intuitively gets the takes me there quicker than if I had go through the traditional theory books. You know. Okay. But like what you're saying for a drummer is you're saying it's easier or it's yeah. better to hook up with someone to guide you through that process rather than like checking out this YouTuber or that thing. Is, to have that guidance is crucial for your growth as a drummer is what you're saying well your question to me was what does it take to get as sick as I am yeah and, and that's a huge that's a fundamental aspect of it is being to get with a teacher having, having an educational background like I said you, if you can learn how to read properly notation on your own then, then great but for me I had to yeah I had to get uh, take private lessons but that's that's a big crucial first step and like you know in terms of like you know s mindset like what what kind of mindset does a young guy or a young girl need to have like is it like an obsession is it like a like yeah other than the practical uh, aspect of playing the drums, like in your head, like, you know, what needs to be happening? What kind of chemicals need to be firing off for you to 
become a, a drum god <laughs> well yeah it should be an all-consuming passion you know if if you ever have to stop and question it then i don't think someone who is consumed by that passion ever does question it you know it's just like i must play today i must practice there's there's some kind of goal that i want to accomplish there's something that i want to be able to play by the end of the day or get closer to playing i think that uh that that mindset is is automatic you know like at some point it just kicks in as soon as you not long after you discover what your passion is so since you saw metallica and you got into injustice for all you you grab onto this this feeling and you've kept it close to you over the over throughout your career and this is still there and something that you that keeps you moving and putting in the time and experimenting and doing the session work and working with darkest style and going on the road and doing that kind of stuff yeah it's you know like you've just kind of elucidated it's taken different forms it's mutated along the years but that that initial spark is very much still there yes bro an overarching curiosity <laughs> yes bro okay bro you don't have to ask i mean you don't have to answer this question but i'm gonna throw it out there anyway i'm not your friend i'm an interviewer now <laughs> you, you ready i'm ready are you addicted to drums bro um i think it's safer to say that i'm addicted to music okay But Has, yeah, if did, I did not play drums for a week, it would it would start to irk me. Absolutely. Do you have so, withdrawals and stuff? So, so there is, <laughs> yeah, there is a withdrawal aspect. There is an addiction aspect for sure. Have you gone through long periods of not playing? Yeah, a week is. No, oh, I think I've. Oh boy, close to two weeks, like ten days. I think that's my longest streak. I, I, was, I bet you were strapped down, bro. You were strapped it, down on a bed I mean, with I a white jacket I, around you. I didn't work out either. It was just I was just chained to the computer, editing this giant fifty-three minute song, and. Uh, so it still was music. It was still music. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, any, of course, it's music. <laughs> like but, no, uh, like heartbreaking, like breakup, or like you know, like you know, no, like you one, bred one some, like I, you bred some, like monster you know and you had to like take it out to some faraway land and dispose of it properly otherwise Why? it would wreak havoc on your neighborhood or like you know <laughs> what is this stranger thing <laughs> <laughs> no when i experience personal anguish then then that just makes you want to work out and play drums more and make more music so it's a release for you the drums and music yeah would you say it's an escape at times, sure. I think all those things are, they correlate, you know, they, they, they're not independent of one another, they, they weave together. All right, bro. I've got some classic questions that I've borrowed from James Lipton, whose interviews I've, I've really enjoyed. No, I want to sort of, cause, um, he just, he just passed a couple days ago. Oh shit. Yeah. Shit. R.I.P. James Lipton. Yeah. Um, R.I.P. But yeah, I think his interviewing is really good. Um, and I'm gonna ask you those questions, bro. Okay. Um, you ready? I'm ready. Far away. <clears throat> Far at will. What is your favorite word? Wow. Favorite word. wasn't expecting this was you that's, that's really interesting uh, I don't know if I have a the best answer for that favorite most, bro favorite most apt <laughs> I'm just gonna go with something really cheesy and just say art cause it's just it's an umbrella term for for <laughs> so much and it's, and it's such a big part of my life so art what is your least favorite word compromise 
What turns you on? Possibility. What turns you off? What turns me off? Unmet expectations. What sound or noise do you love? A heavily distorted bass guitar. What sound or noise do you hate? <laughs> um, small dogs yapping. Best jokes. Well, do you... What is your favorite curse word? Bob, do you have a Morocco in your hand or something? I hear this shaking sound. Oh, no, I'm just scratching my beard. All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <clears throat> um, what is your favorite curse word? I don't know. I mean, I try to make, I try to make that count <laughs> when I use those words, you know? I try to really emphasize something. So, like, I was trying to think, what do I use the most of? Because that would, de facto, be my favorite, right? But, I don't know. I think it'll have to come down to what has the most, what's the most effective. That's probably fuck. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? See, this goes back to the, the topic we were discussing earlier about, like, an all-consuming all mindset. I, I haven't... I've never... Would you like to attempt? The only thing I would ever have any interest in possibly attempting would probably be a, a, a personal trainer role. Because I feel like that's the only other thing that I have <laughs> any passion towards and uh, could possibly excel at. What profession would you not like to do? Hmm. I don't know. Service industry? If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Well done. What would you tell a younger version of yourself? Depends on the age. Say 20. Practice to the goddamn metronome. <laughs> Where would you like to see yourself in five years time? I would like to have a more stable income with music not that it's inconsistent now but more stable whether that's comes from sessions or tours or solo music or whatever and it would be nice as a as a side uh not hustle but just on the side to see my solo music at least recoup from what i invest in it and also just continue to get more hench. <laughs> Any like familial, like family goals? Well, yeah, I mean, I want well, my uh, parents and my close family to stay in, in good health and spirits. And if there's any way that I can supplement that or. Do you like, yeah, do you, are you, do you see yourself in an intimate relationship? Do you want kids? Oh, that. Um, I'm still undecided. As far as a relationship, I'm not looking for one at, the, at this juncture, but uh, I'm still undecided on the kids thing. All right. Well, well, that's all my questions for you, man. All right. I'll have fun editing this. It's going to be two <laughs> hours long. <laughs> Rob, say for coming on and giving us detailed answers, bro. Um, no problem. Yeah. Chatting Breeze, thank you very much for coming on the show and uh, opening yourself up and sharing your journey with us, man. Um, is there anything else you want to say to your fans 
or to the metal community or any last words? Well, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on Chat and Breathe. Yes, bro. And uh, just want to express my gratitude to anyone who follows me and appreciates what I do. Thank you. Safe for coming on again, man. Let's. I'll chat to you soon. All right, sounds good. I'll send you everything very shortly. Safe, safe, safe. All right, have a nice night, man. Yes, bro.